We have three uh, particular texts this morning, and I'm going to begin with uh, the one in the bulletin, and that's out of uh, 1 Samuel 17. Remember, uh, the Israelites are, are gattle, gathered for battle, and uh, they are facing the challenge from Goliath. So beginning in verse 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. And the three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. And David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. And the Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. Then Jesse said to David, his son, take now for your brothers an ephah of the, this roasted grain and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these 10 cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand and look to the, into the welfare of your brothers and bring back news of them. For Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning and left the flock with the keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these wor same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel, and it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. The next uh, passage we're going to look at is just a short passage in Hebrews 11. So turn there if you would. Hebrews 11, we're just going to look at verses 32 and 33. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets. And finally, in Galatians, and we're going to look at uh, verses, or chapter 3 rather, verses six through nine. Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Mike. Thank you and good morning. I have uh, John Flavel's Mystery of Providence here for you. Uh, don't leave without one if you don't have one. Very important book. I think it will it will enhance our study together of the life of David and the providence of God in his life. This is Lesson 9, The Rise of David, A King Without a Kingdom. As Warren just said, we are in our text of 1 Samuel 17 in the Valley of Elah, right on the boundary of Judah. We left our story last time with a threefold description of this Philistine giant. Verse 4, first, his enormous stature. Verses 5 through 7, his weaponry and their weight. And finally, verse 7, I think, is the third description of him the giant seeing the backside of his shield bearer walking in front of him. Now, why 
would I take that position? Well, you have in verse 8 his voice, which gives us his mind. And his mind is filled with confidence. I think the writer wanted to depict that for us vividly. And now look at verse 41. You have the same description. The shield bearer followed, verse 42, with the giant's mind. He looks. He sees. And verses 43 and 44, he speaks. So it's a repeat of the same information. For myself, I think it's a vivid way of retelling the story. Not only what Israel saw, but what this enormous warrior himself saw and laced our story with his unbridled confidence. In that voice, verse 8, he calls for a man. A man to face him. But the Lord God thought so little of him that he will in fact not be sent a man, but a shepherd boy too young for military service. So, beginning with our lesson today, verse 12, we are back home in the serene setting of Bethlehem. This opening, now David, assumes that we're already acquainted with the young man and the present story as it is being unfolded to us. This may account for the surprising way that he is suddenly introduced as if for the first time, a stylistic feature to be sure. Here he is seen in the midst of his family. His father, Jesse, identified as an Ephrite, march, mat, matching another Ephrite, Elkanah, the father of Samuel, chapter 1 and verse 1. The term has two meanings, a member of the tribe of Ephraim and a member of the clan of the tribe of Judah. We don't know the exact intent of the writer, but interesting that both of these men, Samuel and David, were victorious over the menacing Philistines. Now, in this serene setting, we find David. And what's happening? Oh, just the same old day to day. And you and me, the same, just like David. But hear the Word of God for you today. Just like David, you and I are being prepared for the next thing. So, verses 13 and 14, the providence of God that sets all this up Notice its subtlety. The next thing. The three brothers had enlisted, going with the king, Saul, Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, the second, Shammah, the third. Verse 15. All the while, David was traveling back and forth as Saul would have need of him. Do you see the butterflies as they come and rest upon his shoulder, walking along the way in subtlety and quietness? Let's remember this. God makes his men in relative obscurity, away from the traffic, the warp and woof of life. And then He springs them upon us when He is ready for them. They are men in the gap. And they come at the right time 
the right place, and with power. Verse 16, valley, back in the valley of Elah, the continued mockery of Saul and the men of Israel goes on and on and on. For 40 days, morning and evening, verses 17 and 18, all the while, back in Bethlehem, Jesse suddenly breaks the common routine. Look for the providence of God. We have a new assignment. Take your brother's provisions. Take these cheeses, the commander of thousands. Back in chapter 16, we already took note of Father Jesse. Always associated with that key verb, to send. And so, here he is, as it were, again. Sending provisions. Take for your brothers. And now, for the commander. The Hebrew verb is to carry. And that was the command of Father Jesse to his son. Jesse, this rather remarkable fellow, always receiving, always sending, in one form or another. And as we saw in chapter 16, his blessings in the future will be enormous. He says to David, Verse 19, his brothers as well as Saul are in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Well, bless dear old Jesse's heart. Two out of three ain't bad. They are in the valley of Elah. And the brothers are with Saul. But fighting... Not really. I mean, every morning it's get those battle lines straight. Straighten up that plume, soldier. As they rattle around in their armor. Nothing is really happening in the Valley of Edom. Verses 20 and 21. And what is more normal than this? And David rose early in the morning. There will be two people, nameless, faceless individuals in the story. One, a shepherd. The second, a man in the military who will keep the storage. We will address the second and both in verse 22 when we arrive there. But for now, David has 14 miles to travel. Now consider, that could have been three miles. It could have been five miles or eight miles. It's 14 the will of God for David is 14 miles. And in that is a lesson so important for you and for me. Keep on walking. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dissuaded. Don't let anyone tell you you are on the wrong path when God has put you there. Stay where the Lord has taken you. He has an end to the direction you're going. And what is that? That is the next thing. Thomas Watson, the Puritan. Trust Him where you cannot trace Him. God is most in the way when you think Him out of the way. 
This is so relevant to our spiritual lives. I know a young executive hired away to a different firm. He and the division manager had put all these plans together to grow the business in a new direction. And just as they got started, the division manager got hired away. And now this young man is in a different office and surrounded by people who are not exactly keen that he is there in the first place. What do you do? You stay the course. There's a lot of monotony in 14 miles. A lot of distractions. Things that would take you off the path. Stay on it. God has put you there. He has a purpose for it. And it's a good one. And it will be brought to you at the right time. So consider this subtle providence. The morning that David left, he will from that point forward never come to sleep in his own bed again. Never be back to the familiar quarters of the youngest son of Jesse. He will never go back into that familiar pasture with the sheep that he probably knows by name. And think of those sheep. They will never hear that shepherd voice ever again. You see, he had no idea the morning that he left what awaited him 14 miles away. Every day, you and I get into automobiles and we drive. Someplace, somewhere, it's an agenda, a punch list, a have to. The grocery store, the drug store. We are in to traffic. And every day, it is a providence. It could be very much our last day. I think of that often in my drives here. One thing is for sure about our Christian lives. God is always at work preparing us for the next thing. And the next thing very well may be heaven for us. Verse 21. I want you to notice, after 14 long miles on the same path, he arrives right on time. Just as the fighting men move to the front of the opposing army. And so, with verse 22, we address the second keeper, the quartermaster, like the shepherd for the family flock back home. He sets aside the responsibility at hand for, in effect, taking another calling. The first came from the command of his father. Take these provisions to your brother. The second is voluntary. He sets aside his current responsibility, placing something into the care of another. To do what? And to pursue what? What the Lord God is leading him to. So, what is God leading you to? What has He asked you to set aside for Him and for His purpose for you right now. I have known executives. 
I have known medicine, people that are involved as doctors and nurses and trained lawyers who have set aside weeks, if not months, to go out to some benighted land to serve. That's what our sojourn is all about. Serving. So, if you don't sense His calling, or it is not yet, keep seeking Him. Be open to Him. He will direct you. He will give you the desires of your heart. Now notice verse 22. He runs forward to the battle lines seeking His brothers. He is not caught up in the spirit of the moment. No, look at this. He's drawn like a magnet into the action. Now I know some of you would say to me, oh, bloodshed. I, I, can't, I can't bear it. And I understand that. I know that. But God here has made Himself a warrior. And He can't help but run to the lines. He is made for it. Drawn like a magnet. Look again at verse 48. Now running toward the giant. And while David is doing all this running, we have to ask, where is Saul in all of this? Well, he's not running anywhere. He's back in his tent. Back away from the action. Very telling, isn't it? Verse 23, David finds his brothers. Just as the moment the giant makes his appearance. As we pointed out, this is only the second time in all the chapter his name is mentioned. A subtle reminder that the giants of here and now that are in front of us, that take up all the oxygen in the room, that grab all the spotlight and attention, are only temporary. And then they're gone. So, here we are on another Super Sunday. Wall-to-wall -wall broadcast. Analysts. Television personalities. Celebrities of every stripe and variety. There will be bands and billionaires. There will be color and pageantry. An Air Force flyover. And at the end of it all, a ball game. And then it's over. The ticket that at five minutes to ten Central Standard Time is worth thousands upon thousands of dollars will be, by 8 o'clock tonight, virtually worthless. <laughs> the things of this world are always going to be big, bold, bright, and gone. But the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom that has been prepared for you and you were brought to, that kingdom goes on and on and on and on. I remind you, even this Super Sunday. We are made for much bigger things than this. 
to a kingdom and to a future that cannot even be described in human language. Listen to the Apostle Paul. That no eye has seen, no ear has heard, or anything entered into the heart of a man that God has prepared for us that love Him. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Look full on His wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Verse 24, with this Colossus emergence, we are now given the imagery for the moment in body language. The giant moves forward. Israel moves backwards. The Lord had said to us, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, we are not to look upon one stature, but let's face it, His stature is all that we can see. This terrifying warrior has all of the fighting men in Israel in the palm of His hand. He controls the moment. And the day belongs to Him. There is not one man in all the ranks that would dare set his right toe on that battlefield that day. Verse 25. Now notice. It's the men of Israel and not his brothers. If there is a man who defeats him, the king will make him rich. He can marry into the king's family. And these words, make free, meaning his household would be tax exempt. That ain't a bad gig. <laughs> But really now, this coming from a man that was taller than all the men in Israel, of whom it was said, there's no one like him among all of the people. And the people all gathered together, and we with them, holding our hands, looking at Samuel and saying together, give us a king like all the other nations to rule over us. To what purpose and for what end that in the time of crisis, he might sit in his royal tent and draft up his little carve-outs and drivel them out to us? Tax exemptions. Marry this daughter. Marry that daughter. This man... This man is an empty suit. This man is a nothing. And so, once again, the Lord God has to grab us all by the nap of the neck and rub our proverbial noses into the text of the Word of God. That which we thought we had to have, we must have. Oh, have you seen this man give an altar call? Have you seen the amount of money that this man can raise for a campus? 
Why, the following that this man has on the internet will be doubling the parking lot in a matter of months. And so, you make that investment and you believe in that. You just bought the first king of Israel, Saul, who in the valley of Elah and on the battlefield was a no-show. My friends, we need the Lord only. Verse 26, and now the first recorded words of David in all the Bible. He asked two questions. What shall be done? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The first, a clarification of the king's offer. And second, addressing this present mockery. With these opening words, we hear the effect of the Spirit of God that rushed upon a young shepherd boy out of nowhere. He simply sees what no other man that day could see. That this life is not about our prosperity or our comforts, but a sojourn to bear witness that the living God is true, both in living for and if necessary, dying for His glory's sake. Look at His language. Taking away. Removing. It's the expiation of the mockery of Israel. Uncircumcised. A pagan who worships no gods at all. And so with this contemplation of David, the reality is taught to us again centuries later by the Spirit of God Himself. That namely, all of our battles, all of them, ultimately are spiritual. I didn't say that. The writer to the epistle to the Hebrews said that. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. I don't have time to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. The abbreviated sketches of their campaigns of life. Now, what are yours? Understand that the enemy of your soul wants to keep you down and discouraged. Weak and powerless. But you have been regenerated by the same Spirit that rushed upon David. And now you are alive and with power that no man can explain. You have something that the world does not know and cannot understand. The writer to the epistle to the Hebrews just spoke about it. Here's the way he concluded that sentence and gained what was promised. Well, what was promised? Paul, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6, spells it out with great specificity as to each and every life of ours. Abraham believed God, 
and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. The Scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announcing the Gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So that, so that, those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. My Christian friends, the promises of God are yours. He has given them to you so that you might win the campaigns of your life. Insignificant and weak as we all are, His power cannot be denied. I want you to look at that final phrase of verse 26, the living God. That phrase comes from Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 26. It is associated with the voice of the Lord. The living God speaking. Let's just break that out. The word living stresses the reality of His existence and His presence. Your God is alive. He is present and closer than your skin. Speaking. The Word is His voice. And His voice even to you today. Hear it. Memorize it. Pray over it. Absorb it into your life. It is not where you are at the moment. It is where He is taking you to. And He is preparing you for the next thing. My testimony to you here today. I walked through that back door in 1972 with a brand new Catholic Bible under my arm. I didn't know that the Apocrypha wasn't the Bible. I began not with Matthew, Mark, or Luke, but with Baruch. <laughs> but I stayed here. And I took notes here. And I reviewed those notes over and over again. Mr. Pryor found me. Dr. Charles Howard befriended me. I became a student of S. Lewis Johnson. Dan Duncan came alongside. He prayed with me. And he prayed for me. And he always kept the door of Believer's Chapel open to me for some reason. Others came as well. Larry Hairston, Jim Frazier, Dr. Paul Elliott, Bob Ryan, and even to Mark Newman today. All gracious, kind, and open. My friends, I have been through a thousand gates by the grace of God to drive 240 miles down an interstate highway that is always, always under construction. <laughs> and I have come here this morning to tell you that these things are the truth. Amen. Stay on the path. Let no one divert you or direct you off. All things are ultimately spiritual. 
And you are always being prepared for the next thing. The promises of God are yours. And you will win the battles and the campaigns of life because His power in His Word runs through you. That is 1 Samuel 17. And that's the preparation of the warrior for today. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study in the Word of God. And I pray that by the power of the Spirit that speaks this Word, that You will set ablaze Your people for Your purpose to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.